All right then, well, good evening everybody. Um, I'm hoping you're going to enjoy a bit of local history tonight with the uh, Empire Flying Boat Services from Southampton. As you can see, it says on the tin, uh, 1936 to 1940. Uh, just before I go actually to Southampton the Flying Boat Services, I need to set it in context for you by uh, showing you what was happening. This is a 1935 map, and these are the two main empire routes from London to South Africa and to Australia. And these were the routes which were later operated by the flying boats. At, the, at this time, only the Mediterranean section was operated by flying boats, and the rest were land based. So the question arises, why? did flying boats replace the land planes and the reason is the empire airmail scheme which came was conceived in 1933 and through which they planned to carry all first class mail that was letters and postcards the whole lot to, to the empire um at the time uh, when these routes in 1935 were operating only about 10 to 15 percent of the, these first class mail was carried by air so it meant a tremendous increase in the volume of mail to be carried and the land planes in use at the time were totally inadequate so they needed much bigger aircraft and if they employed bigger land planes they were going to have to go to a tremendous expense to improve all the airfields along the route which were subject to tropical storms and they'd have to spend a massive amount of money upgrading them so they came up with the idea will use flying boats because with rivers, lakes and the sea, they could hop all the way over these two big empire routes. So in 1935, uh, Imperial Airways did, made a very brave decision and ordered 28 flying boats straight off the drawing board, no prototype, uh, from Short Brothers of Rochester in Kent. And there's their factory and you can see the, that the first one to be completed was Canopus and there's a second one there and then there's behind them is six, about, I think it's about six holes the next one's coming along but they didn't all arrive at once uh, the Canopus went into service in October 1936 and although I said 28 they actually built 31 because they had to replace one or two that crashed <laughs> so uh, it wasn't until 1938 that they had a full fleet and then they built some larger ones, long range ones, to fly the Atlantic. So, it, as I said, October 1936, Canopus went into service on the Mediterranean section from Alexandria to Brindisi. I'm hoping my little cursor is, uh, you can see it. Yes, that shows. Oh, that's good, thank you. Um, so there she is at Alexandria. And you, you may wonder why it's a rail section between Brindisi and Paris. And that had operated since October 1931. It took two days to go by train. And the reason was that the, the, the dastardly Italians wouldn't allow Imperial British aircraft to overfly Italian territory. And they didn't have the range to go round it. Uh, so that was a, it slowed the services down a little. So, here we are, the first one, Canopus, has gone into service in the Mediterranean. And as uh, the next one came along, Centaurus, uh, they were able to extend it from Brindisi to Marseille. And then by train to Paris, it was an overnight train, so it didn't really delay things. And then they flew from Paris to Croydon, uh, two and a quarter hour, two and a half hours flight. Um, but they because they didn't have enough of these flying boats yet, it was only the inward bound African services and the outward bound Australian services that flew it and the, the opposites, the outward off African and inward Australian, still went by the Brindisi Paris rail link at this time. And this was the 1st and 2nd of January that they started regular services. I do appreciate, I've put a number of little um, press reports up, but I, I wanted to really just to include the headlines, just as a sort of impact of what's going on, but it, they look rather strange on their own. So I included some body text, but I appreciate that you probably haven't got time to read it, and it doesn't really matter because I've 
hope I'm summarising it. Uh, so, 12th and 13th of January, the first experimental flight from Alexandria all the way to Southampton uh, by the flying boat Centaurus. And this cover was carried by it from Fort Johnston in Nyasaland actually started in the most primitive way. It went 120 miles by native runners from to Blantyre uh, from Fort Johnson. Then it was flown by Rana and then Imperial Airways. I should perhaps mention, um, you'll see service numbers here. Uh, they're the official Imperial Airways service numbers. Uh, that was the 410th African service, North Bank. The AN stands for Africa North Bank each time. And, and the when you see some going the opposite direction, they're prefixed AS for Africa Southbound. So that's what they mean in case you're wondering. Uh, and then at the end of January, 26th to 28th, there was a first experimental Southbound service operated by Cassiopeia. And the, the photo is actually of her on that flight leaving over Southampton Water. And there's a cover which was carried on it. Um, after all these events, I have to find commercial covers. And the uh, fortunate, I suppose in some ways fortunately, the, the dealers didn't seem to latch on to the fact that these things were happening. Uh, and so you don't get the normal philatelic flight covers, which I know some people probably think is a good thing. But, uh, and then beginning of February, 2nd to the 4th of February, they had enough flying boats to operate all the inward African services uh, from all the way from Alexandria to Southampton. It took three days. They went from Alexandria to Brindisi the first day, Brindisi to Macon, I think that's the correct pronunciation, the second, and then the next morning Macon to Southampton. But, and also uh, the outward Australian services, but again, the others went, they didn't have enough to do. It was operated by Castor, and uh, uh, that covers address to the traffic manager of, of Imperial Airways. And that's from the same flight. Uh, there's another cover from Cartoon, but I included a second page because there's a rather nice photograph from the Southern Daily Echo. Uh, that flight carried 15 passengers. And when they went uh, from the birth uh, 50 where they'd arrived, a Pullman train uh, took them direct to London non-stop. The, the roof board, which you may not be able to read, actually reads Empire Service Imperial Airways. And they attached a mail van to the end of the train, so the mail went quickly up to London as well. I've got a, been, got a lot of photographs from the Echo, uh, which they're on microfilm. So uh, they've come out quite well, considering it's scratchy old microfilm uh, from the Central Library in Southampton. And you may wonder, well, how how was how did it all work at Southampton? Well, here's a a, a plan. Um, I, I rather wish I hadn't put the flying boat at March off Marchwood. They only moored off Marchwood if the weather was particularly bad. Most of the time, they moored off Hive. And they, these are little launches there and they're going in both directions, carrying the passengers and mail to berth 50, where they embarked or disembarked. And Imperial Airways rented from Vickers Supermarine uh, a works at Hyde, uh, which you can see in the top right, uh, to, to maintain the flying boats. And in the aerial photograph, there's a couple on the hard standing and one at the top of the slipway. And just in passing, just to the right, there's a little boatyard called, um, on the roof it says Power Boats. It was owned by Hubert Scott Payne, who was a director of Imperial Airways. And Jobs for the Boys, he built hundreds of launches for, to, to serve as tenders to, to the flying boats when they were operating all, all, all the way along both the African and Australian routes. So he did very well out of it. Uh, how did passengers get to the flying boats of Mordor Hive? Well, they started at Waterloo Station. On the left is the gate to Platform 11, and you might see, you know, you see Imperial Airways Special board, and on the gate itself, uh, Imperial Airways Empire Air Service. So they boarded a train at Waterloo. It took them right into the docks of the platform at Berth 50, 
they went through the custom shed, down the key steps and onto a launch. And then the next slide, I put on this photograph. Uh, they left the thrifty in the launch, went all the way down Southampton Water to Hive. In the bottom of the left photograph, there's a launch approaching the flying boat. And they went along the side and went into the hatch. It was, if the weather was calm, it was probably okay, but if it was slightly choppy, it was quite a hazardous operation. Some of the people were old and, uh, and found it quite difficult to, to actually do that uh, on, on choppy days. And we'll see an improvement a bit later on. Uh, the next stage in development of the services was uh, on the 23rd and 24th of February. Things are moving quite quickly, almost two, two events a month. Um, in this case, they, they dispensed with the overnight stop at Macon, and so the service was only two days instead of three from Alexandria to Southampton. There's a cover from Mozambique carried on the, the first accelerated service. It was operated by the caster, and there's people boarding her at Alexandria. And finally, uh, 2nd of March, 1937, so only a week or two later, uh, the, all the services, regular services, two, twice a week in each direction, um, went from Southampton by flying boat, no more Empire services into Croydon, uh, just for a change of that show of cover from Marseille to Johannesburg. Uh, I think I have neglected to say, you might wonder why all these covers are to or from Africa, but that's what I collect. So I only have examples of that, but you, anybody interested could equally collect covers from all the way along the Eastern route from India, Malaya, Australia, etc., to illustrate these events if, if you're so inclined. Um, so that regular services now from Southampton, two a week in March, and I, I said it was difficult for passengers to, to board the flying boat. So in April, early April, Imperial Airways have, have built a, an embarkation raft. It looks like two rafts, but in fact it's one unit and it was joined by some U-shaped pieces underwater. So it is a single unit. Uh, that's a press photograph and that's what, a copy of what's on the reverse uh, to the right. And Bottom right is uh, it was featured in the Aeroplane magazine as well. Uh, and the first use of the raft was on the 9th of uh, April when the flying boat Corsair, newly delivered by this time, uh, it was the 11th unit of the fleet. So they shorts had built and delivered 11 units put into service. Again, another photograph from the Echo. I think it's quite nice to feature the Echo, nice local paper. And on the next page, there's a cover carried by the Corsair on her maiden flight from the raft, and a couple of photos of another flying boat, Cygnus, um, going in, in in the raft. So that was a lot more comfortable for passengers. The launches came alongside the raft, they walked across into the hatch. Uh, the next development was in the middle of May 1937 when the Imperial Airways started flying boats on the Alexandria to Kasumu section. Kasumu is in Kenya on the northern shores of Lake Victoria. So that they were already operating from Southampton to Alexandria. Now they extended it to Kasumu, halfway down to South Africa almost. But only every other service. They didn't have enough to operate every service. And there are covers by the first, it was operated by Capella, and as you've seen here on the Nile at Cairo. And there's a couple of covers, one by the first southern southbound and one by the first northbound uh, on, by her. And then finally, they, they had enough flying boats to operate the service all the way from Southampton to Durban. Uh, there's a cover at the top from Southampton carried on the first service uh, by Canopus. And on the right, a, a cover from Durban, the flying boat Courtier. Um, did operated the first northbound service. And the two maps, there's a comparison of the old overland route operated by land planes and the new flying boat route. It was much the same as, as far as Kasumu, and then the flying boat shot out to Mombasa and went all the way down the east coast of Africa. And you may notice that these little 
black circles are, are, are calling points, and there's far less on the uh, on the flying boat route, and that can buy less calls and faster aircraft. The flying boats much faster than the old land planes enabled the service. It used to take eight days to Johannesburg. They got to Durban in six and a half days, so they speeded up the schedule at, at the same time. Now you may, may remember right at the beginning I mentioned the Empire Airmail scheme. Well, finally we get to 29th of June 1937 when it was introduced, and it was introduced in three stages, as you can see from this diagram. And Africa benefited from being the first stage, and the first flight went on the 29th of June. Uh, Egypt, Middle East, India, Malaya were part of the second stage, introduced February 38, and it wasn't until July 38 that Australia and New Zealand became part of it. There's a post office uh, notice advertising its service, penny halfpenny per half pound. It's the cheapest airmail rate ever, I think. Um, interestingly, perhaps, is this, this bit, do not affix airmail labels. It, the, the post office actively discouraged senders from using airmail labels uh, because every letter went by air, so there was no need for them. And there's an example uh, without an airmail label, penny halfpenny stamped to Durban. Uh, this one has the bonus of being signed by the pilot, Captain Bailey of the Centurion, uh, which operated the first service, and there she is in the raft on the day, and the photo above as well. And the, uh, there she is taking off an echo photograph, and they had a massive ceremony uh, on the stern of the red funnel motor vessel, Medina. Uh, you can see the Centurion in the raft in the back, there's a rather clear picture. And there was a special letter from the king put in a special bag to get through in South Africa. And the cover below um, is a, a more unusual one. It was produced by Imperial Airways and only used by them to send advertising letters to, uh, to all the press in South Africa. And after the ceremony, I think 200 of them with these dignitaries went for a big jolly at the South Western Hotel. And no that went home wobbling a little bit, I wouldn't be surprised. Uh, so the next development, we now move to April 1938, and uh, we, they, they finally decided to move the raft up to berth 101 in the new docks. Uh, the, the new docks have been, began construction in 1928, they were completed in 1934, and they moored the raft 12 yards off the key wall. So that they were now only, the passengers only had a 12 yard launch journey. That only lasted a week, in fact. Uh, you'll see on the next one what happened. Uh, another photo on the right from the Echo showing uh, mail and freight being loaded from a dockside crane. And here you can see after a week, they built a pontoon and a walkway, and passengers could come right out of the aircraft and onto the key wall. At the bottom, a um, post office delivering mail to these three chaps in these dark black sweaters at Imperial Airways. It's got Imperial Airways on their chests, and there they are unloading some mail on the embarkation raft. And you can see it clearly there in these two photographs. Um, the, the crane is, you can see the wire coming down, it's loading something. I just think they've got a nice atmospheric photo, but sort of lovely looking here, I guess. So still at April 38, um, it was, the, the schedule was accelerated, fast as it ever was, uh, four and a half days. They couldn't maintain that in the winter, but the summer of 38. And they achieved that by leaving earlier in the morning, flying longer stages. And uh, I've included this, I, I, I think, rather beautiful ship, the Cape Town Castle, which had just arrived at Birth 101 from its builders in Harland and Wolf in Belfast and was about to leave on its maiden voyage. And the motor vessels, uh, reduced, taking over from the steamers, reduced the transit time to the Cape by sea from 17 and a half to 14 and a half days, but the flying boats were four and a half days. On the right is a Imperial Airways test letter sent to their traffic manager in Nairobi, and his duty was to, on the reverse, fill in the date he received it, and then post it back to uh, Imperial Airways London office to check 
so they could monitor whether the mail was arriving as it should do. Uh, there was a minor development I haven't actually shown anywhere in that, uh, oh no, sorry, I've missed it already, I think, so we'll forget that. Um, Birth 108, in September 1938, uh, they moved the raft from 101 to 108. Why did they do that? Well, because there was some spare land where Imperial Airways could build their own terminal building instead of having to use the passenger and cargo sheds at the other end of the Western Docks. I've shown two uh, flying boats and two embarkation rafts, and the, in the photo, quite rightly, there's only one in September, but they introduced the second one in December 1938. So here we are with, a, with two, ember, two photos of the two embarkation rafts in this. That was in December 38. And I mentioned Imperial Airways wanted their own terminal building, and uh, the bottom picture is a sketch uh, published in the Southern Daily Echo of the 27th of March 39. Uh, just make a mental note that it's, they said that it was due to be completed by the end of May, because in the next photo you'll, you'll see that it wasn't. <laughs> and on the right, uh, the white arrow, I think that's the terminal building. I don't know what stage was constructed. I don't know the date of the photo. But Queen Elizabeth looks superb in the George V grading dock. And you can see all this reclaimed land uh, it hasn't been developed yet at all. It's still awaiting development. So I said due to be completed by the end of May, builders ever the same. Uh, photo from the echo of the 1st of July, uh, nowhere near complete. And I don't think it was ever used by Imperial Airways passengers because two months later the war commenced and they left Southampton. But there it is in 1947. During the war, it was, it was used by the US Army. And there it is in the 1970s. Uh, sad story, I went there in the 1990s. I went to the dock gate and said, please can I go in with my camera? Uh, may I take a photograph, please? And the chap smiled at me and said, you're two years too late. They demolished it a couple of years before. Uh, so just before we go to the war, uh, the final a big event was that Imperial Airways on the 5th of August 1939 flew the first of their once weekly transatlantic services from Southampton to New York. And there's a photo from the Echo loading the mail. It was operated by the, um, a, a, a long range flying boat, Caribou. And there's a cover from South Africa. They're very hard to find, that one to Canada. And the route, well, this map, ignore all the red bit, that's nothing to do with it. It's a sort of dual purpose map. The route followed by Imperial Airways is the blue one. So it went from Poole to Foynes on the Shannon, the west coast of Ireland. That was the shortest hop across the Atlantic to Botwood in Newfoundland. And then Shediac and then finally to New York. Uh, there's a cover by the return flight, which went to South Africa and then was sent back again by uh, to Britain. On the right is uh, another photo from the Echo, the crew disembarking on their return. In the middle, it's quite interesting. You'll see flight refueling going on from a Halifax bomber uh, refueling the aircraft over Southampton, which must have been a trial because they actually did it uh, at points because uh, the aircraft used a massive amount of, well, not a massive amount, but a lot of fuel on takeoff. So by refuel refueling them after they've taken off, they could uh, have enough fuel to, to cross, which makes you wonder how, how close they were to running out before they got there. Uh, but uh, sadly, of course, the war came, and there were only eight weekly services before Imperial Airways stopped the transatlantic service. So here we are, the war arrives and on the 3rd of September 1939. Uh, the base was transferred from Southampton to Poole because they were worried that um, Southampton would be bombed, and it's very vulnerable. There's a cover from South Africa by the last service into Southampton at the Penny Hayden rate. It isn't the last Penny Hayden rate, there will be two more, one of the, one of the last. Uh, and the post office notice suspending the Empire Airmail scheme and increasing the Airmail rate to one of the preference. But it was the phony war. And so, uh, 
facilities at Pool obviously weren't as well developed as they were at Southampton, so they wanted to go back to Southampton. And in fact, the flying boats returned to Hyde for maintenance anyway, but the services didn't uh, until the 13th of October. I, this letter I found from in post office archives from Imperial Airways to the post office saying that we'll we'll return to services returning to Southampton from the 13th of October, going to Berth One. Uh, not birth 108, obviously, more, more condition. A couple of covers carried by the first return service. But, of course, things became more threatening and the authorities decided that Southampton was too vulnerable. And on the 4th of January, 1940, uh, they moved back to Poole. And that's a cover by the last service well, the <laughs> last service into Southampton again, as opposed to the one in 1939. And uh, it was operated by the Circe. There's a photograph of a loading at Alexandria. And uh, they didn't, so the services didn't return to Southampton until after the war. And of course, that's a whole new story when they built a big flying boat base at uh, Birth 50. And I think they operated till about 1953, but uh, that's, I don't know too much about that. Uh, don't worry, I'm not trying to sell you this book. It's uh, it, most of the information I've talked about tonight has come from the Southern Daily Echo. And I, and I produced the book in 1996 with all the, the cuttings. And I'm just showing it because there should be a copy in the society's library if anybody is that interested. Uh, you, hopefully, you, you, you can see what to look for. And my final slide uh, is flying over Africa in the modern times. I don't really know nothing, anything about it, but I suspect it might be like this. <laughs> and there we are. That's uh, I've done it in half an hour, so I hope that's okay. I hope you've had a little trip down memory lane, some of you who know Southampton Docks. Uh, I know Mike worked there, so uh, he probably had it, enjoyed it. But I hope you have all had something of interest. And uh, thank you very much. For it. I hope you're all still there.